Hi right, guys, it is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous, little bit smoky day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization at Bugs in a Jar Farm in the Finger Lakes of New York on this otherwise gorgeous Sunday morning. Are we at August 7th or August 8th? 2021. I lose track of time here at Bugs in a Jar. We seem to have had a collapse of civilization here. <clears throat> we had no power all night and now we have no internet. <coughs> have no clue if we're going to get our internet back on <clears throat> Sunday. But since it is Sunday and I've got nothing better to do with my morning since I can't be doing what I need to be doing on the internet, I'm going to bring you this week's Sunday Sermon, Sunday Doomsday Sermon, where I guess I'm going to forgive Bill McKibben for his trespasses against the planet. Well, not forgive him, just uh, pardon him for his trespasses against the planet that we discovered in Planet of the Humans, where Bill McKibben uh, showed his true colors, so I don't know whether these uh, are Bill McKibben's true colors or not. You know, Bill McKibben is a man who truly understands how doomed we are, <clears throat> but he, like everyone else, grasping at straws. Now, I don't know whether he gets into it in this article from the good old New Yorker here in New York. Uh, <clears throat> you know, talking about how we're going to save the planet from burning fossil fuels just by burning down all of the forest. We're going to burn down the planet to save the planet. So, uh, e e even though I have this problem with Bill, <clears throat> uh, we're going to make Bill McKibben from his New Yorker pulpit. Today's Doomsday Sermon, and uh, I will put the link on here. You can read this yourself, but if you just want to hear one Collapsitarian read another uh, Collapsitarian, that's fine. And let me get my right old man glasses. Okay, Bill McKibben, explain to us why it's not the heat, it's the damage. Yes, it's not the heat, it's the damage. Two questions lie at the heart of the climate crisis. So we're going to find the two questions and see if there's two answers to the two questions. <clears throat> Take it away, Bill. The febrile... See, I don't have a, uh, I, I don't have any internet, so I can't look up the definition of febrile. Uh, you know, the New Yorker, they like to impress everybody about, you know, they use all these words that nobody knows what the hell they mean. Okay, I've got five years of college. I'm getting ready to be 62 years old, five years of college. I have a little bit of a clue what febrile means, but anyway, I guess this summer has been febrile. <clears throat> the febrile summer of 2021 hammers home what we know and what we don't know about climate change. It can be summed up in two paragraphs, neither of which is comforting. Okay, paragraph one. <clears throat> we understand about how much the temperature is going to rise if we keep pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. I'm not getting into a debate with Bill McKibben about we know how much uh, that we understand a little bit about how much the temperature is going to rise if we keep pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere or not from this point forward. This is Bill's sermon, not mine. All right. This has been the central scientific preoccupation for more than three decades, translating 
gigatons of carbon and methane into degrees of warming, and researchers have got it more or less right. From James Hansen's original prediction in the late 1980s to the secret reports that Exxon scientists provided executives during the same period, the precision of these estimates increases the more we learn. New data this year on the effect of clouds, for instance, makes clear that they will do more to warm the earth than to cool it, which was one of the last remaining uncertainties. Simply put, doubling the amount of greenhouse gas from before the Industrial Revolution in the atmosphere would increase the Earth's temperature somewhere around 3 degrees Celsius. That is what we are on track to do right now. It is a scary high number. I'm thinking, uh, well, we're going to give the wind one more chance and then I'm going to have to move the microphone <clears throat> to a windbreak if it's a problem. Okay, point number two. <clears throat> We understand much less about how much damage those three degrees would do. It's hard to build computer models powerful enough to calculate the rise in temperature, but infinitely harder to predict the resulting havoc, because that is a function of many things that we can't really measure. Some of the things are human. How will we respond <coughs> as <coughs> societies to catastrophe? It's perhaps not a great sign that many Americans worried about climate change are now heading to survivalist school. In the words of one attender, now I feel like, oh my god, I can set up a mud hut. Yes, I can set up a mud hut to survive the apocalypse. I am not going to go there. Anyway, moving along. But many of these unpredictables are physical. Consider the jet stream. It clearly governs much about life in our hemisphere, but until recently, few scientists suggested that it could fundamentally shift in behavior. And I think Paul Beckwith gives himself a lot of credit, probably deserved, that he was one of the few scientists raising the alarm about the, uh, the jet stream uh, going wacko. Uh, <clears throat> now, the melting of the Arctic has reduced the temperature gradient between the equator and the North Pole, and that reduction in terms seems to be making the jet stream sluggish, setting up such events as the devastating European flooding. Uh, this is, it would have been nice if he had uh, attributed who this researcher, this climatologist was, there's a bunch of links in here. If you go on the link I'm going to provide, he links you to dozens of other, any one of which could become around. Quoting the unnamed climatologist from Potsdam Institute, we had a low pressure field over Central Europe which did not move. It was persistent and long-lasting. Normally, our weather patterns moved from west to east, but this engine, the temperature gradient that we have, is weakened. Yes. There are plenty of other systems that we are now starting to really worry about. The marine equivalent, the Gulf Stream, you know, the AMOC, is quite suddenly slowing, probably because fresh water is pouring off the Greenland ice sheet and disrupting the density difference that drives the great ocean currents. We don't know how close we are to poorly understood tipping points 
that can rapidly turn the Amazon from rainforest into savanna. Kelp forest, the rainforest of the sea, that cover a quarter of the planet's coastlines appear to have shrunk by a third in the past decade. In fact, name a large physical system on the planet and chances are that it is now in chaotic flux. Yes, name a large system and look for your chaotic flux. The lesson to be drawn from all of this the lessons to be drawn from all of this are not novel. One is that we need to slash greenhouse gas emissions with incredible speed in order to reduce the total amount of warming and hence reduce the pushing and shoving on basic physical systems. The other is that we need to prepare ourselves and our civilization for massive dislocations, but we really need to make ourselves think about what it means to be flying blind into the future. We focus a lot of attention on how much the temperature will rise because that is a knowable number. Our po political, diplomatic, and economic debates are conducted as if it's the essential fact. But the scarier question is what each tenth of each degree will do. We don't know and we can't really know. These fundamental systems are clearly intertwined and their breakdowns are likely to cascade. When a team of researchers at the, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology published their landmark study, The Limits to Growth, in 1972, the eeriest part of the prediction was that societal collapse set for some time in the next few decades would come about from the somewhat opaque interactions of the world's systems. That is, the MIT team did not name a single cause that would inflict fatal damage on the planet. Their necessarily crude at the time computer modeling simply showed that past a certain point chaos would ensue. Ever since then, a few people have tracked their predictions and, and an analyst at the accounting firm KPMG working on her own time published a recent assessment. I went over that in a recent, that was a recent chronicle of the collapse. And it shows that we are tracking some of their predicted scenarios all too closely. In that kind of world, we should stand, we should stand on the brakes and we should make sure that we have got seat belts and airbags working, not to mention an ambulance standing by. We are not an accident waiting to happen. As of now, we are an accident in the process of happening. All right, so uh, that's, that's probably the, the end. That, that's the introduction to this long piece uh, so now he is going to pass the mic <coughs> from his sermon. He's going to let some other people join in the chorus. <coughs> Passing the mic. W.J. Herbert's forthcoming book of poems, Dear Specimen, was chosen uh, for the National Poetry Series and will be published by Beacon Press in the autumn, blah, blah, blah. Uh, a five-part series of interwoven poems from a dying parent to her daughter, it examines, quote, the human capacity for grief, culpability, and love, asking, do we, as a species, deserve to survive, close quote. Uh, 
Herbert lives in Kingston, New York, about three hours from here, in Portland, Maine. Our conversation has been edited for length and clarity. And uh, so what follows now is Bill McKibben uh, interviewing uh, uh, the However you, whoever W.J. Herbert, don't even know if W.J. is, is W.J. a man or a woman? I guess it doesn't matter whether uh, W.J. is male or female, because he or she are as doomed as the rest of us. Uh, so I'm going to... Good Lord, uh, we're going to, good Lord guys, this is going on and on, uh, then he moves over to uh, climate school, and then he looks at the scoreboard, uh, so what we're going to do uh, I am, since this is Sunday morning, we're going to read this first section. We're going to have some Doomer poetry uh, to round out. So we're going to listen with this interview with uh, <clears throat> poet W.J. Herbert, and then uh, you can pick it up from here for the second half. Okay, so Bill asked W.J., you have been thinking about the other creatures we share the earth with, you know, our fellow earthlings as I call them, uh, many of which may be driven to extinction in the course of this century. What is that conversation like? And W.J. answers, Dear specimen, Dear Specimen's dying speaker is spellbound by the beauty and fragility of the natural world, but she also speaks for those of us who are heartsick and angry over catastrophic species loss. Though I often don't know what makes my subject matter, though I often don't know what my subject matter will be before I begin a poem, this speaker's urgent voice emerged in drafts written blah 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 anyway uh, as if a lone salamander floating in formaldehyde could mirror her own emotional landscape she muses quote each leg a dwarf tree sprouting from your underbelly seed eyes dark stars in a fingerling Milky Way. Yes, uh, the salamanders, good Lord. Well, I'm trying to make this type bigger for my old man eyes. Okay, but because the climate crisis is dire, a fevered sequence of poems on species extinction emerged in Tipping Point. So this is from the poem Tipping Point. <clears throat> uh, the, the collection speaker admits to young activists, quote, time is short, you say? From gorge to overlook, earth is angry now, no longer on her knees, and still we decimate with each degree black rhino, blue whale, leatherback, chinook. No rainbow, just a grim trajectory, marvels archived in dust, dissympathy. Love that word, dissympathy. And so Bill breaks in, what are the ways you find to avoid a kind of human self-loathing at the moment? How can you keep from despising your fellow human? Answer, because the wealthiest nations drive the current crisis, poems like Squander 
seemed necessary to deer specimen, its speaker represents we who minimize our personal responsibility as we plunder or condone the plundering of the planet. Though she is concerned about our culpability, as I am, she also tries to console. Seth, the grandson to whom she's telling a bedtime story, and after his nightmare, Sarah asks, worries about the crisis, so she soothes, quote, The boy loves the manatee's whiskered face, flippers tipped with fingernails like his, and he wonders if the calf feels as dreary as he does and where the tide's cradle will carry them. Close quote. I, there's a story on the mainstream media today, by the way, that more manatees have died so far this year in the state of Florida than in any year since they started keeping records that the year is just a little bit over half over and already over 900 dead manatees have washed up and it's not just because of boat collisions <clears throat> it's not just because of boat collisions <coughs> and the red tide as you might think it's talking about <clears throat> how the seagrass beds, you know, that the kind of like the kelp forest, you know, that the manatees uh, depend on, uh, on seagrass. Well, the seagrass is disappearing <clears throat> and the manatees, most of the dead manatees are just starving to death. Uh, the ones that don't get hit by boats or, or die from the red tide and algae blooms are simply starving to death because they have nothing to eat because the seagrass beds, kind of like the kelp forest of Florida, like every other kelp forest, is going down the tubes. <clears throat> uh, this poem, you know, the one the, mentioning the manatees, is one in a series I call the Sarah poems. Each explores the loving relationship between the speaker and her daughter, I wrote them hoping to give myself and readers some relief <coughs> as we struggle to confront <coughs> this crisis, art that embodies the creativity and empathy of our species often consoles us, though this collection <coughs> ends with a boy who, enchanted by a moonlit herd, no longer wants to be human. But do you want to be human? Okay, uh, so I'm not really sure WJ answered that question, so let's see. Move on to the next question. <clears throat> Mortality hangs over these poems. How do you think about our own lives and deaths in the context of this huge and overhanging crisis? W.J. answers, after ruminating on climate catastrophe and her own impending death, the speaker in the smell of almost rain suddenly sees the day as stunned and distilled into a large-hearted leaf with a bug crawling up it. <clears throat> Quoting from the poem, Fist of raspberries budding <coughs> Fist of raspberries budding nearby while Sarah's cattle dog dives into a leaf lake. Yes, at the edge of the right aid lot green spears spilling over him as if he is being guillotined by spring's manic, weedy happiness. Then just getting back to talking about this, when my own joy and grief are over, I would like to be buried in a natural cemetery preserve that stewards land for native flora and fauna the speaker in Deer Specimens 
Shanadar first flower people wants an equally meaningful end. Refusing cremation using fossil fuels that pollute, she imagines herself lovingly placed near the fossil bones of an extinct human species. Nothing subtle here. Okay, take it away. No, lay me down in that cave where others were covered with cornflower, hyacinth, yarrow, and hollyhock. Leave me unsheathed so that time swaddles me in muddy vestments. Every bone turn to stone with a minerals kiss and we are gonna wind it up there because I have a wiggly little dog in my lap and so anyway he goes from interviewing that poet and then getting back to the usual doom and gloom but anyway I'm gonna put the link on here and uh, you know, try not to be too hard on Uncle Bill. He really disappointed a lot of us <clears throat> with uh, Planet of the Humans. But what are you going to do? <clears throat> we all have our blind spots, Uncle Bill, and uh, burning down the planet to save the planet is, is a pretty big blind spot, brother but we won't hold it too much against you and with that uh, I need to wrap up today's Sunday sermon because a little dog and I want to go find this very specific canna lily it's called a tropicana <clears throat> if anyone knows how to uh, help me find a tropicana canna lily in the Finger Lakes of New York I would love to hear from you but anyway do get out there and enjoy the poetry of the moment while you still can yes little dog you need to go enjoy a chipmunk like that bye guys this is where uh we are up at uh at pond view of the hip camp is pretty much full. I've got uh, I've got the Maggie May trailer rented out. I've got the Sancho <coughs> Sheraton tiny house rented out. I have folks up in the Piney Woods. So the little dog and I are spending uh, our weekend camping in our camping in our own backyard. It is a fine but smoky day camping in our own backyard. Come see us. Bye, guys.